There's a popularity today of post-apocalyptic shows. If you've noticed, those shows that are like the end of the world, some great disaster occurs, or aliens invade, or whatever it may be, and <clears throat> it's all about people trying to survive without food, without grocery stores, without provisions. And so they have to go out and get it on their own and defend themselves. And I don't know about you, but being a guy, I like that kind of thing. You know, I like seeing how to survive in those kind of situations. But it would not be fun to actually live through something like that. Imagine if in the Puget Sound area, we had some disaster. And there was no delivery of food to the grocery store. So once the initial looting of the stores took place, there would be nothing available to eat, except for maybe fish and things like that. But imagine being, though, in the desert. The Israelites being a number of two to three million people in a land where there was no grocery store, there were no sources of food for that many people. And here they are in close proximity, and they're hungry. 30 days had gone by, and no food. I mean, it's amazing that there wasn't some sort of riot that took place at this point. Um, all it takes for us is one storm, and people start looting stores, right? Here's two to three million people, but they do grumble. Now, Sometimes we laugh at the Israelites because they grumble. We laugh at them because they complain and stuff. But put yourself in their shoes for a minute where you're vulnerable. You're out in the middle of nowhere and your life is in the balance. And so not only are you vulnerable, but your children are. And that makes it hard. I think the hardest as a parent looking at your kids and your spouse suffering and, and so on. And so here they are hungry, no food. They left Elim. That name means palms. There were 12 strings, 70 palms. And so here are all these springs of water and, and shade. It was a beautiful oasis, but they left that and they entered a place called the wilderness of sin. Now that word sin actually means not like sin, like sinning against God. It means either thorns or clay. So they go into a land, a wilderness of thorns, from the oasis to the wilderness of thorns, and 30 days with no food. No wonder they are grumbling. I mean, how many of you men, when you're hungry after church, and you want something to eat, and your wife is talking, and you're, oh, come on, come on, woman, let's go. I want to go to Taco Bell or Taco Time or whatever it is. You know, guys, we grumble, we get grumpy. When we don't have something to eat. These folks were being a number of things. First, unreasonable. Look at what they said. They said it would have been better for us if we had died in Egypt. Forget about all God's miracles and God's deliverance and God's future for them. They said, you know, when we were sitting around this, the meat pots and we had bread so much that our bellies were full, it would have been better to die then than here where God has called us. They were being unreasonable. They were also being faithless. God's called us out in this desert to die. You know, knowing God and who he is, do any of us know God like that? That's not the God of Scripture. They're being faithless. They had a lack of vision. What could God do? More than all we can ask or imagine. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, when we pray, God does more than you can ask or imagine. Where's the food going to come from? Well, we'll see a pretty amazing place. They were prayerless. Instead of praying, they complained. You ever been in that place? They became mean, negative, critical. They started cutting on Moses and Aaron. Now later on in verse 8, what they didn't realize what they were really doing in their hearts, it tells us there that your grumbling is not against us, but against who? God. It's against the Lord. 
And so they didn't realize all these things going on in their heart were against the Lord, not trusting. But in spite of all of that and their misbehavior, God is a gracious God. He turns their grumbling into a prayer request, not because they deserved it, but because God is good. And he says, okay, I hear that you have a need. Instead of thumping them like he had the justification to do. Well, in verse 4, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now we learn that through reading this passage, God sends quail in the evening. So every evening they have meat, as much as they want. And in the morning, they are given manna. So they wake up, and there's dew on the ground, and when the dew dries up, what's left behind is this manna. Now the quail was a natural, common thing that you would see and possibly eat in that part of the world, and they were used to that sort of food. But manna was very different. Manna was supernatural. The word manna actually means, anybody know? What is it? Exactly. In Hebrew. What is it? Why? Because they had no clue. They'd never come across anything like this on the face of the earth before. Psalm 78 tells us this. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them grain of heaven. This isn't grain from earth. Man ate the bread of who? Angels. Now that's a pretty good meal. Eating bread from heaven, the food of angels. God was gracious. God was good. He did more than all they could ask or imagine. He went beyond and provided food from heaven. Now in verse 31 of chapter 16, if you were to look down there in your Bibles, it says, it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So God doesn't make junk. He made some awesome food for these folks. Now, God sent the manna for two reasons, it says in verse 4. Well, the, the first reason's implied, I should say. The first reason is that God just provided for his people so that they had food to eat, so that they could survive. So God provided, number one. But the second reason is that God sent the manna to test them, to test to see if they would obey. Now, what was the test? The test took place in their hearts and was manifested in their actions. Did they really trust God to provide food every day? God wanted to teach them a lesson. It's a, it's a difficult lesson. It's called dependence. Daily dependence on God who provides. Not dependence on the government, not dependence on your, your, your job or anybody else on the face of the earth. Dependence on God who provides. The dependence for us might seem like a bad word. Um, we think of dependence, maybe in terms of communism. This is in some sort of cosmic communism where the people are dependent on the government to give them everything that they need. Neither is this dependence something that builds up your pride personally. I don't know about you guys, but as a man, I want to be able to work and provide. You know, we work hard and we provide, and there's a sense of reward in that. And that's a good thing. I think God put that in us. But when we're vulnerable and we're caused to depend on God for something we can't provide, it puts us in that place of humility. And so that's why this is so difficult oftentimes for us because it hurts our pride. But the kind of dependence that we see God teaching his people is appropriate and necessary if you want a relationship with God. So if you want to be able to commune with God, have a relationship with God, you need 
to learn dependence. Matthew 5, 3 tells us this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, for part of God's kingdom, we learn that we are poor in and of ourselves and we are dependent on our heavenly Father for all things. Now, when we get to the New Testament, I mean, I think it would be great to have some manna in the morning, don't you guys? I would love to make a, a manna bagel or a manna sandwich or something. See what that tasted like. But we have something different in the New Testament that is a daily provision that actually Jesus teaches us about in Matthew 6.11, our version of manna today. He teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus actually teaches us to be dependent on God in prayer on a daily basis. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. God, give us this day what we need to pay our bills. Lord, give us this day what I need to grow spiritually. You know, Give us this day the things that I need to be able to serve you. God, give us this day your word that I might be fed and, and so on. And so we pray that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And it covers all forms of nourishment and provision in our lives, not just food. And so today we're going to look at four ways that God provides through this daily bread. And when he provides today, it's no less miraculous than the manna that he provided in chapter 16 of the book of Exodus. Although it was glorious and it was amazing, we'll see by the end of the message today that we have the true bread from heaven. This more miraculous and more amazing than what we see in the book of Exodus. So the first thing, in God providing physical sustenance for us, we see in Israel, as they went out to gather the manna, they went out with a jar, and it was an omer, is what it's called, and the omer is an equivalent of two liters today. So imagine holding a two liter of Coca-Cola, cut off the top, and start packing manna in. God said, I want you to go take an omer of manna for each person in your household, or literally here, in your tent, because they were out camping, by the way. And so each person took what they needed. Some took more, some took less, but there were some, though, that disobeyed. Remember, the test was to see if they would be dependent on God and obey. And they failed the test. Look in verse 20 and 21. It says, But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. We see a supernatural occurrence with those that disobeyed. They took the omer, and more, and kept it in their tent, maybe they were thinking, I'm not sure if God's going to provide tomorrow. So instead of being vulnerable and dependent on God, I'm going to depend on myself and try to store up for myself my treasures in my own home. And that's what they did. And in the morning they wake up and supernaturally it got rotten. And I say supernaturally because I don't know about you guys, but I've never bought a loaf of bread and had it turn into worms and stinking in the morning. You know, maybe a little bit of mold if you get one of those old loaves of bread, but today bread won't even grow mold on it anymore because they put so many preserves in it. But <laughs> And if it does, keep buying bread where you bought it because it's probably real bread. But it got rotten and it stank. It was useless to them. It became a burden for them because they didn't trust God. They didn't depend on him. They depended on themselves and their life stank. You know, does your life stink? Is there things that have just turned rotten all around you? Well, there might be something going on here. 
in your own relationship with God. Now, there's something else in a, a miracle that happened, a supernatural way that this manna um, acted among the people was that if they, on the sixth day of the week, took twice as much because they weren't allowed to go out on the Sabbath on the seventh day and gather food for themselves, then supernaturally that manna would be preserved until the next morning. And so the sixth day they took twice as much and God preserved and provided. Why? Because they obeyed. And they would pass that test if they took twice as much. Now we'll look at the Sabbath in a little bit. But one other thing I want to point out about the manna, if it didn't go rotten and it wasn't preserved, um, it was still out on the ground. And what happened to it? The sun came up and it melted. That's another supernatural thing. I've never met a loaf of bread that melted before me. So if it was not collected, it melted away. Why? Because God wanted a daily dependence. If it was still there all through the day, guess what? They didn't really have to trust, did they? But because it disappeared and it melted away, then the evening came and they wondered, is God going to provide tomorrow? Now, of course, we know the story. He, he does it for 40 years. He does this. But aren't we sometimes in that place where we think, will God really provide this time? He has in the past. He's always taken care of me. You know, I've never gone hungry, and there's evidence of that, right? But sometimes we wonder, will he take care of me this time? So what God wants us to learn in terms of our own sustenance is that He'll provide food and clothing and shelter and a paycheck and material possessions, whatever we need. The things that we have today, the things that he's provided thus far, are no less miraculous than the manna showing up every morning. In Psalm 145, verse 15, it says, The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. And so, you know what that's saying is that God feeds even the birds, even the deer. I've been waking up around five in the morning and that's about the time the deer come into my yard. There's like six or seven of them now, every morning, eating off my fruit trees and my dead grass, which they can have as much of that as they want, I guess. God feeds the animals. He takes care of all of his creatures. How much more does he take care of you? And that's what Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 6. He taught us, don't be anxious about your life. How many of you guys are obeying that right now? Do not be anxious about your life. And then he explains, will you eat or drink? And then he says, don't be anxious about your body. Right, ladies? About clothes. Your father knows what you need. He knows what you need more than you know what you need. And so Jesus goes on to explain this great principle that we see at work in Exodus 16 as well, this timeless truth. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What are all these things? Well, all the things that you need. God gives us what we need. He doesn't give us according to our greeds. So what we might mistake for God's lack of provision might be our misunderstanding because we're greedy, and he's not providing according to our greeds. But when we step back and we see how God's provided according to our needs, then we begin to sit in amazement and with thankful hearts, joyful hearts, because our God is a God that supplies. He's a God who provides. There was a time when Marianne and I, we didn't have any kids yet, and we were young married, just started in ministry, 
I think we were living off $600 a month or something like that. And we didn't have any food because something had gone on. And, and we didn't really tell uh, a lot of people close to us what was going on. Um, I think only one person knew. And we came out of church one Sunday after serving with the youth and having that great time of fellowship. And we opened our car door to find the car packed full of Costco groceries. I mean, so, you know, bags of stuff, huge boxes of stuff. And from the floor to the ceiling, our car was full. You know, that to me was a miracle that God took care of us. I was so worried about it. You know, being the man, but God took care of us. It's part of what the church is for, too, you know. Some of us are too proud to share. We have a need, but there's a lot of us that want to serve. A lot of us want to take care of one another, and, you know, sometimes your pride might keep that from happening. So if you got that much pride, guys, remember that word, dependence. Depend on the Lord. Too much stuff will turn to worms and stink. And that's one other thing that happens in our life. We amass all these things, all these treasures. And it seems like the more stuff you have, the more maintenance there is, and the more money you spend, right? I mean, I was laughing the other day because my father-in-law was telling us, you know what boat stands for, don't you? I was like, no, what? Bust out another thousand. So if you've been thinking, oh, I wish I had a boat, remember what boat stands for. Sometimes those things become a distraction. Now, sometimes God's gifted people to um, oversee uh, things like that, and I just know I'm not. I could hardly keep oil in my cars. So, but whatever happens, we give God the glory. Look at verse 7. It says, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. In verse 12, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. You know, I think, what was the glory of the Lord in the morning? Well, the glory was to wake up and see God's provision. It magnified the fact that God's our provider, that God is faithful, and that he's good, and that he's caring and loving. And so the very provision of God and the most basic things become the prism by which his glory shines through and we know him in a way in which we wouldn't have known him otherwise. And so I would challenge you, even in the basic things, the fact that you had breakfast this morning, it magnifies the glory of the Lord. You know, some of you guys will have a barbecue tonight. Instead of thinking, wow, I worked so hard for everybody today and glorifying myself, glorify God as a family. Thank you, Lord, for this food. You know, make sure we remember everything we have from our house to the car to the socks we're wearing to um, just being able to breathe is from God. Well, the second thing we see is that spiritual nourishment is part of this daily bread. The Israel had to celebrate the Sabbath. The Sabbath is something that seems a little foreign to us today, but the word Sabbath means cease or desist. It means stop working, worship God, and serve the Lord. So as a family, he said, I don't want you guys going outside your tents. I want you to stay together as a family, and I want you to worship me on the Sabbath day. And so that's why God provided twice as much the day before so that they would have food for that day and the Sabbath day. But sure enough, there were some who disobeyed and they went out Saturday morning to look for manna. And when that happened, there was no manna. Just like God said, I won't provide on that day because I've already provided the day before. But when you go out there, or when they did go out there, God was angry. He was upset because they weren't being dependent. 
They weren't being obedient. They went out in their own strength. And so, instead of trusting in what God said, they trusted in themselves. God was a little upset with them. But in this, understand what's going on. God puts on the Sabbath day spiritual food before physical food. Today, you observe me. Food's taken care of. Why? Because I want you to be fed with my word. And so this physical lesson teaches us a great spiritual truth. Deuteronomy 8.3, Moses is looking back upon this time, and he says this, And he humbled you, and let you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so if you thought your daily bread being food was the main priority, we learn that's just to keep you alive so that you can continue to worship God. And so we have a couple of examples in the Old Testament of spiritual food sustaining men. Moses, after he had broken the Ten Commandments and he went up a second time to get the Next set of Ten Commandments, God revealed his glory to him. Well, the tail end of it anyway. If he saw the fullness of God's glory, he would have been killed. And he came down that mountain glowing physically because of his time with God. But one of the things it tells us about his time on the mountain is found in Exodus 34, verse 28. It says, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And so he's with God for 40 days and 40 nights, eating and drinking nothing, yet he survives. God magnifies the truth that the spiritual nourishment from him is so much more important than food. Elijah, he ate the spiritual food. When Jezebel wanted to kill him after he had defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Look what it says in 1 Kings 19. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Forty days and forty nights, he was sustained on one meal that an angel helped to meet. He went to the mountain of God to meet with God. You see, there's a spiritual food that's so much more important that we need to focus on. Sometimes we get caught up in all the physical stuff sometimes. Jesus spent forty days and nights in the wilderness eating no food, and Satan showed up and said, Hey, why don't you turn this rock into a piece of bread? You know, Christ was hungry. This was one of the temptations. And in response, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8, 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Are you dependent on God for your your spiritual food? Church. Church is like our Sabbath today. We call it the Lord's Day. The families come together and we worship and we hear from the word and we're fed and we we experience fellowship. And so we set aside a day, a time to worship and serve the Lord. It's so important, so key in our relationship with God. But where does that fit on your priority scale? Is it something that you do set aside? And you say, well, it's going to cost me time at work. It's going to cost me time golfing (laughs) or whatever it may be so that I can be fed, so that I can meet with the Lord. Or how about morning devotions? Waking up in the morning is sometimes really hard to do, right? 
we try to wake up close to the time that we leave to work. You know, just enough time so we can get a shower, shove something in our uh, face hole, and, and get moving on. And so devotion time, I think it's really important that we spend time with God. As Jesus did, he woke up while it was still dark, and he prayed. He just sits for us this great example of spending time with the Father and being fed on a daily basis. But what oftentimes competes with that is busyness, tiredness, maybe our breakfast, whatever it may be. But, you know, we need to be fed in the Word. Open up the Word and hear what the Lord has for us. We need to be fed in that time of prayer. And some of us are walking around spiritually anorexic. We haven't been eating and we can't figure out why we're not healthy. What's going on? And sometimes it happens in the form of fasting. Jesus even teaches us about fasting in Matthew um, chapter 6. And fasting is one way of setting aside physical food to say, I'm going to eat my spiritual food. Oftentimes people will use the meal times to actually crack open the Bible and pray. Now some of you can't do that because of health reasons, but perhaps there's something else you can fast from. But I think fasting is an important thing to try once in a while. Get your spiritual muscles nice and strong. Check it out. There's great rewards there. Well, we're running out of time. Man, let me just wrap, wrap up the last two points. One other thing we see about God providing spiritual food is opportunities to do the will of the Father. That might sound really strange to us because we equate food as in taking things in. You know, feed me a meal or give me a message from the Bible. And so... There's this intake, and we think that is nourishment, but there's a part of nourishment that is an outflow. That's part of our spiritual food, and that's this. When Jesus went through Samaria, and he met that woman by the well, a questionable woman, morally. His disciples said, hey, we're going to go into town and grab some food. It was lunchtime, and Jesus sat by the well, and he had some ministry to do. And so, while they were out running to Taco Bell, Jesus was talking with this woman about the gospel. And he explained, you know, you need living water. And she came to faith in Christ, gets saved, runs back to town to get everybody to come back and hear this Jesus. And the disciples came back while she was gone getting her friends to come and hear Jesus. And it says this in John 4, 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Because they, they brought him a lunch. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. Now, the disciples were probably really confused. And they said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Did you bring him something to eat? You know, what's going on here? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are yet four months, then comes harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. And about then is when all the people from the city start coming to Jesus. And he says, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Doing the Father's will is part of our food. And so we might not realize one of the reasons we're not doing well spiritually, we're going to church, you know, we're trusting in God to provide, and, and we're reading our Bibles, but there's something missing. And we feel bored as Christians. You know, maybe we've turned into um, professional critics of church or something. You know, we, we've gotten really good at the church lingo and the culture, and, and we criticize it, make fun of it, and so we've gotten into this mode. We've been fed so much, but there's not an outflow. And so we're not having a complete diet. There's something missing, and that is reaching out and connecting people with Jesus Christ, you know, bringing them to church, 
sharing with them the message. If you don't know what to share, at least share with them how you got saved. I mean, are we active, involved in the lives of other people? Doing the will of the Father? When I was in college, I would pray every morning for opportunities to share the gospel. And this was my normal practice. So every day, every day, God sent somebody for me to share with. I was so pumped about it. It was like, send me today my daily bread of doing your will, Lord. And boom, somebody. I remember one time I'm sitting in the, the commons uh, eating lunch. And I can see across the whole commons and out the windows, here comes this goth guy. Long hair, scary looking guy. His nose had been broken a couple times, probably been in fights and stuff. And, and I can tell from way out there, this guy is cussing. And he's just shaking his head. He's, he's upset. And he comes busting through the door. And the door flew open. Everybody kind of looks up. And, and I thought to myself, uh-oh. This is the one, Lord, isn't it? And, <laughs> and sure enough, he came and he sat right in front of me. And I was like, okay. Hey, do you ever go to church? That was my first question. <laughs> I didn't quite know what to say at the time, you know. So I was able to share with this guy, you know. Even though he had believed in the Norse gods and he was kind of weird. I gave him a Bible tract and at least shared with him Jesus and that Jesus loved him, died for him on the cross. You know, how to get saved. And, you know, that's something that energizes your walk. It's a little scary sometimes. It's a little uncomfortable. It causes you to have to get out of your seat. But sometimes we're so full with stuff. You know, we've just been taking in all the time. We're so full and we're so bloated, we've become lazy. But when we get up and start doing the will of the Father, you know, God will provide the opportunities if we pray. Lord, give this day my daily bread in the form of that as well. He'll open the doors. But just be ready. It's a dangerous prayer, but it's an essential prayer. Well, the last thing we see is that the bread God provides is for eternal life. The manna that they received, God said, hey, I want you to take some manna and put it in a jar and keep it in the ark for generations to come so that they would remember my provision for you. And this manna was supernaturally preserved, almost as a picture of this bread that lasts for eternity. Bread that gives eternal life, which is interesting because when we get to the New Testament, there's one that claims to be this bread from heaven that gives eternal life, and his name is Jesus. When the 5,000 were fed, by Christ, this great miracle, the people were pretty jazzed about him. They wanted to make him king by force, and he had to get out of there um, because he said, nope, this isn't the Father's will. And he got across the other side of the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. They found out where he was, and they followed him. And he had a message for them. And we see this in John 6, 27. He said, do not work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Now, let's read on in John 6, 32. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the, gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always, you know, so we don't have to work anymore, so we can keep hanging out and having these great campouts like the Israelites did with Moses. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And so it's through Christ, the true bread from heaven, that this manna passage is all about, ultimately, 
as it points forward. A picture of Jesus. And so we're in this world and we're hungry for something and we're not sure what. I don't know if you ever had the munchies before. You're hungry for something and you're not sure what. Something salty, something sweet. And that's what the world is for us. Sometimes we're walking around and, and nothing quite satisfies our desire. Nothing gives us the life that we would long to have. But Christ says, I'm the true bread from heaven. And if you eat of me, you're going to have life abundantly. Now, before I came to Christ, I thought I was saved because I knew Jesus was real. Until somebody pointed out, well, even the demons believe. And I said, oops, well, I better actually respond to Jesus. And so it's like taking a bite of the bread. You can look at the meal. Like one of my uh, kids did last night. They looked at the meatloaf all night long. You're going to sit here until that meatloaf's gone. Okay, well, he's like, I'm going to be here for a long time. <laughs> but we have to take a bite. We have to commit. We have to respond. And that's what it is. When we believe in Christ, there is an actual turning to him. Turning away from our own direction and from the world and turning to Christ and calling out for him for salvation for true life. And he is the true bread from heaven and he will give eternal life. He died on the cross for all your sin that he could transfer to you his righteousness and give you life eternal. What an amazing provision. Even though we were grumblers, God sent the bread from heaven anyway. Even though we weren't looking for him, he looked for us. And today, He's looking for you. And he's calling out your name. Will you commune? Will you take a bite? Will you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today? You know, if that's where you're at, you know life has been empty and you're still hungry for something, you're going to find eternal life, true life, abundant life in Christ. And so let's respond to him now. If, if you've never accepted Christ, like me, maybe you've believed that he's real, maybe today is the time to respond and begin that eternal life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming to this earth, for dying for my sin. I receive that payment. I receive the righteousness that you gift me with in this brand new eternal life. I trust in you to be my Savior and I follow you as my Lord. As I begin this new life, Lord, help me to live in dependence on you every day for how to live. Independence for abundant life. And for all of us, God, we pray that you would help us to stop worrying, stop grumbling, and live by faith, knowing that in the morning, God, you're going to send that manna that you won't forsake your own children. We love you for that, Lord. Help us to trust you even more today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.